Good morning and welcome. Today, Lieutenant Governor Reynolds and I, along with uh, Patty Fields of the Iowa Volunteer Commission, the Iowa Commission on Volunteer Service, and representatives from Hy-Vee and Principal are pleased to announce a new public-private initiative called Volunteer Iowa and Call to Service. The Call to Service is designed to challenge and encourage Iowans to give back to their communities through volunteerism and services. I would also mention Aaron Bailey from Hy-Vee, uh, Andrew Allen from Principal, and Helen Eddy, the Executive Director of the Healthy Estate Initiative, are also available as resource people. I see some other folks lining the walls also who are leading volunteer efforts in our state. Volunteerism has been important to me uh, from the beginning of my service. Uh, back in 1994, I signed an executive order, 19, executive order number 48, which established the Iowa Commission on National and Community Service. This commission is now the Iowa Commission on Volunteer Service and works diligently to promote Iowa's capabilities and works collaboratively with nonprofits and other organizations in Iowa. Also, annually, since 1983, we've presented the Governor's Volunteer Awards as well to literally thousands of Iowans. And it's our way of saying thank you and to recognize people that give so much. Volunteerism is an integral part of our state's future well-being. It's what makes Iowa really a special place. Our objective for the call to service is to increase the number of Iowans that are volunteering as well as the number of hours that they do volunteer their service. Iowa currently ranks second in the nation in volunteerism and just as we want to become the healthiest state in the nation and have the best schools, we want Iowa also to lead the nation in volunteerism. I will be rolling up my sleeves and taking time out of my schedule to serve as well. In fact, yesterday I was with Jerry Sneff and we were at Salisbury House and Chris and I both volunteered as judges on the, on the uh, unique uh, car uh, event that they have there each year. And on Thursday of this week I will be volunteering at uh, Central Iowa Shelter and Services in Des Moines as well. The Call to Service initiative requires more than support from the public sector alone. Private sector buy-in and leadership is crucial to the success of this initiative. And I want to especially thank uh, IV and Principal Financial Group, two of our uh, large Iowa employers, for making a significant contribution and providing leadership, along with the Lieutenant Governor and I, on this project. Uh, their partnership can help Iowa reach our goal of being number one in the nation in volunteerism. I'm very pleased now to turn it over to Patty Fields, Chair of the Iowa Commission on Volunteer Services. Patty? Thank you, Governor, for that introduction, as well as making volunteerism a priority. On behalf of the Iowa Commission on Volunteer Service and the many partner organizations that are presented on the Commission, we are excited to work on this important effort. Many organizations represented here today and leaders have helped construct a detailed plan to develop and better connect Iowans to volunteer opportunities. Over the next month, we will be gathering <coughs> input on this plan from community partners across the state. As you may know, for the last couple of years, we have ranked near the top for volunteer rate, and we have more cities ranked in the top 20 than any other state in the country. So why do Iowans need to do more? Because we can do more. And we know by doing more, Iowa will be a better place. And even though we're near the top, still less than half of Iowans volunteer. And research tells us that it isn't because volunteers have more time on their hands. In fact, volunteers are more likely to work and have children than non-volunteers, and on average are just as busy. Research also tells us the biggest difference between a volunteer and a non-volunteer very well may be how much TV they watch. But as we know from the flood of 2008, and being from the Iowa City area, I can tell you I have felt that and watched that personally. Iowans step up when there is a need. And we have needs. Over 4,000 children in Iowa are waiting for a mentor. Dozens of communities need volunteer firefighters. And tens of thousands of students in Iowa could benefit from a volunteer mentor. We have needs. 
To address those needs, we've set our goal for this effort to raise the average number of hours each I when volunteers to 50. That's less than an hour a week. Currently, the average number of hours of an I1 volunteers is 34.2. If we simply raise that to 50, less than 16 hours per volunteer per year, I1 would provide an additional $1 million worth of service to benefit our state for a total volunteer benefit of nearly $3 billion. Additionally, when people volunteer at least 50 hours a year, they are 40% more likely to continue volunteering year to year. This is what we call volunteer retention. And increasing the volunteer retention is the easiest way to increase the volunteer rate. It's like plugging a leaky bucket while filling. But 50 is a significant number for more reasons than just that. It is the tipping point in volunteer efforts that garner the greatest results, especially in education and health, two areas I know that are very important to the governor. There are so many ways for Iowans to volunteer, from being a volunteer firefighter, a little league coach, serving meals at a church soup kitchen, volunteering in a park for your city, helping keep Iowa beautiful by picking up litter and trash, joining a service club like the Lions Club, which we have Gary Fry here from today, or tutoring a child. Right now, there are thousands of nonprofits and local government agencies with opportunities for volunteers on our go-to website, volunteeriowa.org. So no matter your interest, passion, or skill, you can find how to get your 50, and in doing so, make Iowa better. And it's now my honor to turn it over to Lieutenant Governor. Well, good morning, and thank you, Patty, and thank you for your enthusiasm and your dedication to volunteerism. Uh, our call to service initiative launch is very timely. T tomorrow is September 11th, a day that we will never forget and now recognize as the National Day Service of Service and Remembrance. Our September on September 6th, the governor proclaimed September 11th as Volunteer Day of Service and Remembrance. All across Iowa, nonprofit organizations, schools, communities, and other local groups have planned service projects for the public to participate in on September 11th and throughout the week. I too will be doing my part this week. I'll be volunteering later today at the Edmonds School and will be participating in an art project with the young kids. Iowans can find their local kickoff project by going to Iowa volunteer, or volunteer Iowa, excuse me, dot org. The call to service utilizes the strengths of Iowa's charitable sector and builds upon the model of community-based problem solving. It is our hope that Iowans will embrace the call to service initiative and do what Iowans do best, and that is giving back to their local communities. We want to mobilize and we want to connect Iowans with meaningful volunteer opportunities in their communities and really challenge the private sector to support and help strengthen Iowa's volunteer infrastructure. So let's do what we can to make sure that Iowa is number one in volunteerism. Now we open it for questions for any of the group up here on this subject. <coughs> Any questions? It's P A T T I F I E L D S. Yes. Are you? What's your position? I'm the chair of the Iowa Center for Volunteer Service. And where are you from? I'm from Iowa, I'm from Iowa City. I'm the vice president at the United Way of Johnson County. The three billion figure is, is that here. current? Is that what would be added? Is what? What's the context? There is, um, we use the total number of hours collected for volunteers, and every year they determine what that is um, equal to and, and what's how they be paid. So adding those 16 hours per volunteer over the year would increase it by a billion dollars. So that's average per volunteer right now. That's not the average for all hours. Is that 32.4? I mean, 30, 34. It's the average for all hours. That's average yeah. for all hours? Yes. Yeah. It's average for all Iowans, not per volunteer. And we have less than half of Iowans that are actually volunteering. So you can, you know, can increase the number of volunteer hours by getting more volunteers, but also you can do it by increasing the number of hours that the people that are already volunteering do volunteer their time. Isn't the old saying that if you want something done, ask a busy person? Exactly. Do you so got it you exactly <laughs> right. That's the old saying, and it's very true. And, and it's generally the people that are really busy that also give uh, and volunteer their time because they understand how important it is to give back and help other people. 
So how do you get the people who are snoozing on the couch to do this? Well, turn off the TV. <laughs> it's also something they can do for their own health. And you know, and, and, and I would say for your mental health as well as your physical health. Because I think one of the most joyful things one can do is to give back and help other people. And you know, it's it's the old saying, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And I really think that is true. People uh, have a sense of, of, of self-worth and satisfaction from making a difference in other people's lives. And we have a lot of caring people in Iowa that do that and do it very generously. We're just trying to encourage more people to do it and the people that are doing it to consider giving even more of their time and talent to help others. You know, it it ties so well with the Blue Zone Initiative and the Healthy Estate Initiative, and it's really local community driven, and we've seen communities all across the state step up and participate in this. So that's really how we're going to reach out at the local level and from the individual organizations and communities all across the state of Iowa. That's where they're going to engage people in their community to participate. And we've seen at the Start Anywhere Walk, uh, we had a tremendous response from that. We're doing it again on, on October 3rd. So it's a great way to tie that into volunteering. They're very, very much connected. Other questions? Okay. Well, I want to thank, thank all of you for your participation and support for this project. We would answer other questions on other subjects as well. Go Governor, uh, you got this op-ed piece uh, right. the other day yeah. about Obama wearing uh, on his walking and said that government should not be in the business of picking winners and losers, and of course, some people have been commenting on here, like blogs are saying, gosh, the governor is hypocritical. He's giving out over 100 million bucks, and the total payout is, you know, the Lee County is forgiving a huge amount of, of, of taxes. What's the difference between that and the federal government doing that? And as you know, Republican candidates Trump all over the state saying that state, you know, that government shouldn't be doing this kind of thing. Well, we also announced that we're intending to reform the Iowa tax structure and eliminate some of the impediments and barriers in the Iowa tax structure that makes us uncompetitive. In some areas, Iowa is very competitive because of the single factor formula. So if most of your sales are outside the state of Iowa, uh, you're only based on our single factor formula in sales. We don't add payroll and property like they do in many other states. We're very competitive. But if you're a project like this, where a substantial amount of your customers are Iowa farmers that are going to be buying fertilizer, and by having that fertilizer made here in Iowa rather than imported from overseas, it's going to be more economical and it's going to save farmers money. It's also going to create some very good jobs, permanent jobs, plus the ones in construction, all the related ones in, uh, you know, what you heard are in the thousands. Now, uh, the situation we had was the state of Illinois and, and I actually met with the president of the company, and I told him the difference between Iowa and Illinois is Illinois has got a history of corruption. You know how many of their former governors are in prison. Uh, you know, and they, in fact, I served the only two in, in the last 40 years that haven't gone to prison, Thompson and Edgar. But, but so Illinois has a history of corruption, but they also will promise you the moon. But the only problem is then they'll pull the rug out from under you, as they did with their uh, increase in income, at both corporate and individual income tax last year. Iowa has a history of honest government, and we follow through and do what we said, just as we did when we got rid of the tax on machinery and equipment. We did that when we had that big project uh, for uh, IMSCO Steel, which is now SSAB. But we didn't do it just for that project. We ended up getting rid of the tax on machinery and equipment for everybody. Now that was done over a period of 10 years, but it's been accomplished and it's been a great thing for us because it's made Iowa more competitive for cap and capital intensive industry, including the complex we have in Eddyville, what's going on in Fort Dodge and Osage and all over the state of Iowa, plus all those ethanol plants which have substantial equipment. So that's where we want to go. We want to have a competitive tax structure, but in the short term, in order to uh, uh, successfully compete for these really good jobs, uh, the state of Iowa uh, needed to provide some incentives, and we did. And Illinois then 
offered a lot more. And in fact, their incentive package was much richer than ours, but they still chose Iowa because when they look to the future of Illinois, they have the most debt per capita of any state, and they have the most unfunded liability system in their pension system. So if you're a business that's looking to the future, you, things are likely to get worse in Illinois. Iowa, on the other hand, and Barron's Magazine, by the way, just came out with a comparison of the states on fiscal management. Iowa ranked second best in America, second to South Dakota. Illinois ranked second worst, second to Connecticut. Now, the point is that we have gotten our state's financial house in order. We've restored the money that's been taken out of the cash reserve and economic emergency account. And so the state is positioned to be able to reduce the unfair tax burden in the future so we don't have, but I think we'd be unrealistic to say there will never be a time when we'll have to provide some incentives because it is a world economy out there. We're competing for good jobs and what we always, when we make these decisions, need to make sure that the taxpayers of Iowa are the ones that benefit and the workers of Iowa benefit from good paying quality jobs. And, and I believe in this project that Debbie Durham and uh, also the uh, local elected supervisors in Lee County are absolutely convinced this is a worthwhile and good investment. But in the future, we're going to change the tax structure so we don't have to provide as much incentives that we provide these kind of uh, competitive uh, um, tax and business structure for everybody. But do those incentives choose winners and losers? The Republicans upstairs say they do. Yeah, Illinois, Illinois is the loser and Iowa is the winner. <laughs> well, That's the also, point. Also Illinois is the loser and they're the loser, but it's not just because of the incentives. They're the loser because of the way they have mismanaged their state's finances for too long. Because they have such a massive amount of public debt, because they have all of these problems, and because they have a history of not being honest and uh, reliable in terms of following through and doing what they said they would do. We in Iowa have a history and tradition of honest government and following through and doing what we promised to do. That's the difference, and that's the real contrast, and that's the reason why I think Iowa's going to be a winner on down the road. And we want, however, not to be choosing who wins and loses. We want everybody to win by choosing Iowa because we're a competitive state that really keeps its tax and regulatory burdens reasonable and fair, and one that wants to attract the kind of quality jobs that are going to grow our economy and give people the economic opportunities they deserve. So would you say it's unrealistic to say there will never come a day when the state won't offer incentives? Why isn't that true at the federal level? Why are you criticizing President Obama for doing what you're doing? Well, there's a big difference between what the federal government is doing and what we're doing. The federal government is actually putting a lot of impediments and barriers in the way of job creators. We have the highest corporate income tax in the world. When I was governor before, we were very successful in getting Canadian investments here in Iowa. Uh, there, there's a one com Canadian auto component parts manufacturer. I think we attracted six of their plants to the state. Uh, uh, Frank Stronick from uh, Magna International. Uh, we got Epsco Steel, we got Skyjack. We had great success, but remember, back in those days when I was governor in the 90s, the Canadian dollar was only worth 65 cents to the American dollar. Their financial institutions were weaker than ours. Uh, they had uh, more financial debt problems than we have. Today, we have a massive $16 billion federal debt. The federal government spending more than a trillion dollars, more than it's taking in every year, and 40 cents of every dollar is borrowed money. And then we have federal agencies that are you know, making it extremely difficult. We had a, a clean coal plant that wasn't built in Marshalltown because of, because of that, and we can go on and on with what the EPA, and, and now they couldn't pass uh, uh, cap and trade, and now they're basically trying to impose it administratively. And the difference is what I and other governors are doing is we're working to reduce the tax and regulatory burden. This administration spends its time threatening the very people we need to invest in creating jobs, that we're going to raise your taxes, 
because your small businesses that are making money more than a certain amount, you're gonna, we're going to raise your taxes, and, and uh, we have all the regulatory burdens have been placed on, on the energy industry, which is critically important then, to our country. So there's a very significant difference. And it's all you have to do is compare what's going on in this state, or in Indiana, or in Michigan, or in Wisconsin, with what's going on in Illinois. And by the way, Illinois now has a teacher, teacher strike going on today, too, on top of everything else. Talk about dysfunction. Now, I mean, I, I, the governor of Indiana, Mitch Daniels, says it's like living next to the Simpsons. <laughs> but, but, you know, we in Iowa are proud of the fact that we have a lot of hardworking people and a lot of people that volunteer and give of their time and talent to help others. But we are also uh, not unaware that we live in a world economy and we're competing for the jobs of the future. Now the good news is that we are making progress and turning turning the corner on that. But it would certainly help if we had leadership at the federal level that was also working to reduce the tax and regulatory burdens and not always threatening, uh, you know, not always blaming other people and threatening people with, with more uh, taxes and regulations. There was a press release from the Romney campaign over the weekend quoting you talking about uh, that now famous line about, I didn't build this business. You, you bring up farmers in there as not having uh, government support, uh, but with all the subsidies they get, I was curious to have you explain that thinking a little bit. Well, first of all, I grew up on a farm. Uh, we did a lot of work, not only on our own farm, but on my uncle's farm and our neighbor's farm. We have. A, the uh, U.S. Department of Labor basically trying to prevent young people today from doing what I did as a kid in terms of raising livestock and, and uh, uh, working with equipment and things like that. I did that at a very young age and I think that you learn a good work ethic that way and those are the kind of things that I see coming out of the federal government that are really detrimental to agriculture. Now, there's also some things the federal government has done that benefits farmers as well. Uh, and some people would might maybe say they have maybe been too generous in some of the things they've done in that area. And I think, uh, indeed, as the new uh, uh, farm bill is passed, I think you're going to see uh, people look at that, especially uh, when, when we look at the marketplace has certainly uh, provided, uh, unlike back in the 80s when we were going through the farm crisis, today we have a very good market. We have very high prices. Now, there's some aspects that create some problems also for people feeding livestock and things like that. But, but we have, the corn prices have, to a great degree, offset the losses from the drought for some people. And, and add to that uh, uh, crop insurance, which 90% of people have today, that's made a, made a real difference for agriculture. But I, I guess my concern is that most farmers will much prefer to have access to the international marketplace and be able to sell their products directly instead of relying on government subsidies and government programs. That's the direction we want to see us go in the future. Governor Romney is also running the ad saying he'll create 130,000 jobs in Iowa. You I said 200,000. I have an even more ambitious goal. How are we but I, first of all, I'm glad that we, the present president of the United States does not have a plan to create jobs. And many of his policies have been uh, impediment to the very entrepreneurs and business decision makers that we're trying to attract to Iowa. And, and you know, he comes from Illinois, and that's the way they run government in Illinois. I don't think it's the way we ought to be running the government in this country. Are you going to segregate off the jobs you create and and <laughs> all of our, you know, No. Well, we're all we're gonna, we're gonna gonna be 330,000 jobs. Well, well first of all, here. I am just glad we have a president that's on our side that is setting goals and wants to create private sector jobs. That's exactly what I've said. We need a president that's going to do what I'm doing, what Mitch Daniels is doing in Indiana, what uh, Rick uh, Snyder is doing in Michigan what uh, Scott Walker is doing in Wisconsin, and all of those governors have been setting ambitious goals, reducing the size and cost of government, and focusing on private sector investments to create jobs, and reducing the regulatory burdens. And that's the contrast. Contrast that with that state that sits between us. 
Illinois, which has taken the route that Obama has at the national level. Borrow more money, and that doesn't get you anything but a higher interest rate to pay on that debt. And let me tell you, at the federal level, the Federal Reserve has kept interest rates at a rock bottom low. Now, every 1% that interest goes up is another $160 billion annually that's got to be paid to pay, uh, just to pay the interest on that national debt, to which we get no benefit. And the short-term thinking that I see in Washington is, well, let's do another stimulus. If we can't get the Congress to do it, then we'll have the Federal Reserve do it. Does that make sense for this country to continue to mortgage our future to keep and, and, and what does it do to our seniors that have saved some money that are getting virtually no return on their CDs? This is not a policy that makes sense for this country or for its long-term uh, well-being. And that's the reason why I think we need leadership in Washington that's in tune with the new governors that have come in in these states like Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, Ohio, you know, you name it. Uh, but do you think you'll be taking credit for the same jobs, both of you? Well, it's the private sector that deserves the credit for creating right. these jobs. It's not government that's going to create these jobs. But by reducing the regulatory and tax burdens and making it clear that, you know, we're not against entrepreneurs, we're for entrepreneurs, we're interested in encouraging them to take the risk and invest and create jobs, that we will, as I did in Cedar Rapids the other day with the, uh, the, the, the company that we were with, uh, 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 they just put their uh, global headquarters there. Uh, Diamond B. Diamond B. Good example of a company that took the risk, even after they got flooded out, to rebuild and put their investment in Cedar Rapids. And, and you've got Rockwell Collins there, similar situation. We've been there to recognize them. We've been at, uh, at, um, um, at Kinsey <coughs> Manufacturing. And, and we're going all over the state of Iowa to recognize the people that really deserve the credit. Not me, not the president, but it's the entrepreneurs and the businesses that make the decision to take the risk and create the jobs and grow the economy. What I want to do is make sure government is working not against them or penalizing them or threatening them with more tax and regulatory burdens, but instead trying to give them uh, an environment in which they feel they can make a profit, that they can create the jobs, and they can uh, achieve those ambitious goals. I think my job as a leader is to set goals and to try to uh, facilitate <coughs> good things happening. And then if it happens, I think we can all, um, you know, I think there's plenty of credit to go around. Back Governor, how many jobs have you created so far? Are you going to run again for another term if you don't hit 200,000? Well, I am, let me just say, we are working day in and day out to bring more business and jobs to the state of Iowa. And we're going to continue to work at that diligently every day. Uh, and I would also say that uh, uh, I'm not going to make any decision on the next election until 2014. I'm much more concerned about the direction this country is going and the fact that it is just not affordable and sustainable to have 40 cents of every dollar you spend be borrowed money and to have a $16 trillion national debt. That's why I am gravely concerned about the direction the country is going, the lack of leadership to address this critical issue. The president had his opportunity. He appointed a bipartisan commission, Simpson-Bowles. He could have said, 